This is the true story of Elizabeth Alton, a funny, excitable and outgoing nine-year-old girl, someone that hadn't yet experienced much of what the world had to offer, and sadly, she never would. When a friend lured her into the woods one day, promising to show her something new and exciting, why did only one of them walk back out? What would become of Elizabeth? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Elizabeth and all those affected by this case. Elizabeth Alton was born on December the 15th, 1999. She was the baby of the family, the youngest of her two siblings, Anthony and Stephanie. She was the apple of her mother, Patty's eye. The family lived in St. Martin's, Missouri, a small town with just over 1,000 people. Everyone knew everyone, and everyone loved Elizabeth. She loved all things theatre and performing, and at just nine years old had been cast in the big school play. She was excited and was throwing herself into it wholeheartedly. She practiced her lines every day with anyone that would read with her. She would even practice her song as she walked around town. She really did have her whole life ahead of her. October the 21st, 2009 was a typical Wednesday. Elizabeth and her siblings were back from school and dinner was in the oven. There was chatter and laughter and no sign of anything untoward about the evening. It was just a normal Wednesday. Just after 5pm, there was a knock at the door. Mother Patty answered. She opened the door to six-year-old Emma, one of Elizabeth's friends. She asked if Elizabeth could come out and play with her. Mother Patty said no, it was a school night and dinner was almost ready. But the girls were relentless with their persuasions. They pleaded, they begged and they jumped up and down. Patty knew she didn't stand a chance. Patty told Elizabeth she had one hour and no more. She wanted her home by 6.15pm. The girls ran off happily and Patty went back to making dinner. 6.15pm came and went, but Elizabeth hadn't returned. Friend Emma lived just four houses away and she was conscientious. She didn't push boundaries. When Elizabeth still hadn't come home by 6.30pm, Patty started to worry. Patty called her phone, but it went straight to voicemail. She then rang Emma's grandmother Karen, who Emma and her siblings lived with. Karen said she hadn't seen Elizabeth either. In fact, she had no idea that Emma had even knocked at her door that afternoon at all. The sun was setting and there was no way that her Elizabeth would be out voluntarily. She was terrified of the dark. By 7pm, police officers were at Patty's house. The police started at Emma's house. Karen and Gary, Emma's grandparents, were distraught, but they didn't have any information. They maintained that Elizabeth had never been there. All they could do was join the search. The Cole County Sheriff's Department, the Highway Patrol, and even the FBI are desperately trying to find nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton. Well, I think that the woods possibility is, you know, the kids in this area play in the, in the woods, in, in the farm areas back there. More than 200 volunteers, including military, housewives, public servants, and construction workers left their jobs to join in the search. Contacted my supervisor, asked him if we were going to assist in, in any way, and he said he was going to ask for some volunteers, so... Emma said they had been walking through the woodland near their houses. They had been darting in and out of the neighbouring lawns and backyards. She said that an hour later, Elizabeth set off home just as she was instructed to do. Emma said she watched her friend walk off. 
and that was the last time that she had seen her. Officers couldn't see any evidence that pointed towards foul play. They were more concerned that she'd gotten lost in the woods. An easy thing to do. By 10pm, almost a third of the town was out and looking. But the search party eventually had to slow down and stop for the night because of how dark it had gotten. As soon as the sun rose, they were out again in full force. A few hours later, with concern continuing to mount, the FBI was called in to help and they moved quickly to bring Elizabeth home. The search team deployed dive teams, helicopters and sniffer dogs. All the known sex offenders in the area were interviewed. The FBI also started looking at Elizabeth's phone activity. She had received a call that afternoon from someone called Alyssa. Six-year-old friend Emma then asked to speak to the police again. She had a new story, but she was scared to tell detectives. She said that her half-sister had been the one to get her to knock on Elizabeth's door that afternoon. Her half-sister was 15-year-old, Alyssa Bustamante. Emma said that when the two were outside playing together, Alyssa came and joined them and encouraged Emma to leave them alone. Elizabeth said she had to head home and started to walk off. This timed perfectly with the call that came from Alyssa. Emma walked back to her house and stayed outside playing alone. This left Elizabeth and Alyssa out together and alone. If what Emma was saying was true, she hadn't been the last person to see Elizabeth that day. As far as they now knew, it was actually Alyssa. Meanwhile, a search party in the woods made a strange discovery. A group of volunteers had stumbled upon a huge hole that had been dug up and then covered back over. They alerted the police right away, but strangely there was nothing under the soil. The hole was empty and there was no sign of Elizabeth or anything belonging to her in that area. But detectives had seen a hole like this before. In fact, they discovered more than one. When detectives had been at the Bustamante house talking to Emma, they had noticed several holes in the garden that looked similar in size and shape to this one. With all signs pointing towards a Bustamante house, a warrant was issued to search the home. Everything seemed normal and in order until they entered Alyssa's room. It painted a very troubling and chilling picture. It was in disarray. Everything was everywhere. There was writing all over the walls, one of them reading, It was written in blood. It was written in blood. Cards from her father, who was in prison, were scattered around the room. Detectives then found Alyssa's diary. One entry read, If I don't talk about it, I bottle it up, and when I explode, someone's going to die. They also noticed a paragraph that was scribbled over in pen, Fortunately though, investigators were able to uncover some of the original text. To do this, they simply shone a light at it from behind. Two words stood out. Slit and throat. Born in 1994, Alyssa came from a troubled and very broken family. Both of her parents had substance addictions, her father was in and out of prison, and her mother would often leave the home while she spiralled downwards. Eventually, Alyssa and her siblings went to live with her grandparents, Karen and Gary. The couple soon gained full custody of the children. Karen adored Alyssa and although the children had had a tough life, she did her best to raise them well and be a constant and supportive presence in their lives. As she entered her teenage years, Alyssa started causing harm to herself. She was admitted into a psychiatric hospital. This was after she took an overdose and began to mark words into her arms. Doctors that assessed her described her as being violent and angry. She was diagnosed with severe depression and was prescribed antidepressants. When she was released, things only began to get worse and more concerning. On her various social media platforms, she changed her list of hobbies to killing people and cutting. She often told friends and her boyfriend she wanted to know what it was like to kill someone. She also said that she had a dream of burning down a house with a family still inside it. 
Alyssa was brought in for a formal interview alongside her grandmother and a juvenile officer. Alyssa started off by recounting her day. She said she had come back from school at around 3.30pm. She had then gone for a walk in the forest at around 4.30 to 5pm. By this point, detectives knew that Alyssa had actually skipped lessons that day. So, pretty much straight away, she was already trapping herself in lies. She said she was supposed to take Hammer, her dog, on a walk, but she decided not to take her as she was annoying. Instead, she walked alone where she saw the two girls. She then returned to the house an hour later. She maintained that she had never been out with Elizabeth on her own. When confronted about her diary entries, the interview would take a drastic turn. Alyssa's demeanour had now changed. She was shaking and quivering. (laughs) However, she still didn't tell the truth right away. Alyssa now changed her story. She said the pair had been playing out in the forest. Elizabeth had fallen, hit her head, and then died instantly. Now panicked, she had tried to conceal the body by burning it. Given the final page in her diary, detectives knew that this wasn't true. However, this was the start of the truth coming to light. Detectives simply had to keep chipping away and poking holes in her stories. The final entry in her diary that had been scribbled over had now been completely uncovered and it read as follows. I just killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throats and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the oh my god I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kinda nervous and shaky right now though. Okay, gotta go to church now. LOL. This entry had been written on the same day that Elizabeth had gone missing, October the 21st. When confronted with the diary entry, everything started to unravel. They showed Alyssa her final journal entry. They asked her if Elizabeth's throat had been cut. She said yes and Karen, Alyssa's grandmother, burst into tears and walked out the room. Alyssa told police that she told her sister to go over and ask Elizabeth to play. Once Elizabeth was lured out of her house, Alyssa told Emma to go home. Alyssa told Elizabeth that she had something to show her, but it would be about a 15-minute walk into the woods. Alyssa was already armed with a kitchen knife while she was holding the hand of nine-year-old Elizabeth. The two girls arrived at a shallow grave. Alyssa had actually dug this hole five days before. This was premeditated. She had been planning this for quite some time. Alyssa began throttling Elizabeth. She then grabbed a sharp implement, jabbing at her a total of seven times in the chest. Alyssa then dragged this same sharp implement across Elizabeth's neck. She then buried Elizabeth and covered her with leaves. Police knew that to be able to find Elizabeth's body, they would need Alyssa to guide them to her. Of course, she knew exactly where Elizabeth was. Alyssa agreed to take police to her remains. She lay just 15 minutes from home, and her body wasn't exactly buried very deep. Some of her body parts were protruding from underneath the leaves. The search for Elizabeth Alton had come to a devastating end. A day after Elizabeth was found, police announced that they had placed the 15-year-old under arrest. Alyssa had been charged with first-degree murder. Police also interviewed Alyssa's boyfriend and asked him to undertake a polygraph test. Although they suspected he likely knew that something had happened, they determined that he didn't have anything to do with the murder of Elizabeth. He wasn't implicated any further. Alyssa had dug two graves in the weeks before. She was essentially waiting for the perfect opportunity. It remains undetermined who, if anyone, the second grave was intended for. But police suspected she was actually planning to kill her two younger brothers. Well, by opening the November hearing, the judge will allow the general public to attend the trial as well as keep the suspect in custody. At that certification hearing, 
Judge Beatum will decide whether to try the 50-year-old suspect as a juvenile or an adult. Despite her lawyer's efforts to get her a lesser charge on the grounds of a troubled childhood and her age, the judge ruled that Alyssa would be tried as an adult. Alyssa pleaded not guilty and trial preparation got underway. In June 2011, a huge blow came for Elizabeth's family and the prosecution. Alyssa's defence team requested that her lengthy confession should be thrown out. The judge ruled that because of her age and the line of questioning put forward, at least part of her statement would not be admissible in court. Her trial was delayed and set for early 2012. Knowing they were up against it, the prosecution decided to offer Alyssa the option of a plea deal. Therefore, Alyssa withdrew her not guilty plea and pleaded guilty to second degree murder. This spared her the chances of receiving the death penalty. As part of the deal, Alyssa had to recount what had happened that day in all its awful detail. The tension in the courtroom was palpable and everybody was sitting in stunned silence. The defence team heavily relied on Alyssa's childhood, upbringing and mental health issues. They claimed that her prescribed medication made her more prone to violence. Despite this, Alyssa was sentenced to life in prison for second degree murder and 30 years for armed criminal action. Under Missouri's law, Alyssa may seek parole after 30 years. Alyssa appealed her sentence in 2014, but it was denied. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons. Your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, Earl Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebrenek, Joy Burton, Dawn Crock, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist, Anita Ford, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.